Hi everyone, this is Intro to Africa at Flagler College. I'm Dr. Young. Um, our discussion today will be on <clears throat> um, some of the larger kingdoms um, and even empires of the medieval period in uh, the Sahel region of Africa, um, kind of this band that runs, you know, just south of the Sahara, uh, all the way across the continent here. Um, and I want to refer back to this map, which we ended the last lecture with, and that is, uh, displays the linkages um, of trade between the different regions of Africa. Um, and so, you know, even though some of these links were less sure and less constant than others, uh, the links sort of um, horizontally or west-east were less common than, say, you know, the, the Trans-Saharan, the established Trans-Saharan trade routes um, or these uh, routes along the east coast of Africa. But over time, um, you know, goods from the Indian Ocean uh, made their way up here into the Sahel region of Africa. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go on here. Um, and uh, culture uh, uh, was shared as well um, to some extent. Um, and so, you know, while we need to certainly differentiate between different regions, we can find some <coughs> elements of continuity and some shared culture uh, sort of across the continents that so we don't want to force those um, links between the different regions necessarily. So I want to start out our discussion today by um, uh, talking about the Kingdom of Ethiopia, which we introduced last time and uh, talked about Aksum, uh, the ancient kingdom, uh, which was converted to Christianity in the fourth century. This was a coastal kingdom um, along the Red Sea here, uh, modern day Eritrea, uh, sort of right where the Gulf of Aden meets the Red Sea, um, and uh, with lots of trade links to South Arabia, um, as well as some even to Egypt uh, via the Red Sea. Uh, but Ethiopia was, on the other hand, remote from the rest of the Christian world and developed its own particular Christian culture. Um, and uh, this continued to um, evolve uh, as time went on. Um, and the Aksumite peoples of the coast, who were part of the original kingdom, were forced by Muslim invasions into the interior of Africa uh, uh, in the interior of the Horn of Africa, I should say, into the Ethiopian highlands up here, okay? And so they moved further and further to the west, thus interacting with and interbreeding with and converting uh, the Cushitic peoples of the interior. These are the, you know, the people who um, spoke these uh, Nilo-Saharan languages um, who inhabited this region. And so we have this sort of clash, or rather the shared culture between the Aksumite, uh, who are more closely uh, closely akin to the peoples of South Arabia, uh, and the Cushitic peoples of the interior here. And that cultural interaction, uh, linguistic interaction, and so forth, is what ultimately forms Ethiopian society, and that society persists all the way to the present. Um, now, Due to the chaos brought about by the um, uh, Islamic invasions, the Islamic incursions into Aksum, uh, it took some time to regain stability in Ethiopia. Uh, but that is achieved in the 12th century by a ruler, really more of a legendary ruler than anything. There, there aren't a lot of sources about him, uh, but he is celebrated, called, um, well, actually, no, I'm coming to Amdasion here. I'm jump, jumping the gun here. Uh, the first dynasty to establish hegemony over the Ethiopian highlands with a Christian king or emperor at, at its head was called the Zogwe dynasty. Um, and you can see here that Zogwe was particularly centered on the city of Lalibela. So this is not a terribly far distance from Aksum, but it is inland into the highlands. And Lali Bela is a really important center archaeologically um, and moreover artistically and architecturally. Uh, Lali Bela is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, uh, especially because the Zagwe dynasty built these incredible churches um, that are, well, they are monoliths. 
Monolith, of course, means one stone. They were chiseled out of these sandstone cliffs or um, uh, sandstone bedrock, I guess it is. It's really not a cliff. It's more uh, that they, they dug in, they chiseled into the bedrock here um, and ultimately produced this church. This is carved out of stone, out of a single piece of stone. Like most Christian churches, it is in the shape of a cross, um, uh, but you can see here that it has rooms, I think even floors in the interior here. Um, and uh, this is one of the hallmarks of this period of Egyptian Christianity. Was uh, So this is the Church of St. George in Lalibela, um, and it has been weathered over the years, and due to the wars fought in Ethiopia, there are even some pock marks and bullet holes and things like this uh, in the church. Uh, but it is, for all of that, pretty incredibly well preserved, and made, given that it's made out of a single piece of stone, um, the structure is really quite durable. Um, so this is a this is an amazing monument. I think I have another shot of it here, um, uh, more from the bottom um, of the the pit that it's in there. So uh, truly a wonderful monument um, that the Ethiopians were able to produce. Now the Zagwe dynasty lasted for about a century and a half. Uh, close to that until it was um, uh, due to, again, the Islamic threat and also some internal dissensions uh, weakened and overthrown by one of the key figures in Ethiopian history, um, a guy named Amda Sion. Now, Amda Sion, as I said, is, um, as I started to say earlier, was a, you know, kind of a legendary figure. Um, he is certainly has taken on some of the characteristics of myth, but there are interesting sources about him, like Sunjata, uh, about whom we are reading this week and, and about whom we will, we will talk uh, here in a few minutes. Um, you know, he is this incredibly important unifying figure. Amda Sion's armies overthrew the, the weakened uh, Zagwe dynasty at the end of the 13th century. Um, and established rule further into the, uh, into the highlands, further to the west and the south, on the plateau, um, the Ethiopian plateau. Now, traditionally, um, the, the Solomonic period, or the Solomonic dynasty, as it's called, uh, really um, sees the full uh, development of the Ethiopian Christian culture. Um, there is a sacred text in Ethiopia produced during this period called the Kebra Nagast. It is written in Ge'ez, which was the sacred language uh, developed in an earlier period, the sacred language of Ethiopia, um, the Aksumite language. It is Semitic, though um, Ethiopia, you know, is, a, as I said, a kind of combination between these Aksumite Semitic peoples and the Cushitic peoples of the uh, interior of Africa. Uh, but it's, it's written in Ge'ez, and it recounts the story of King Solomon of ancient Israel, the ancient Israelite kingdom. Uh, and in the Bible, for instance, it says that Solomon was visited by a woman named the Queen of Sheba. Traditionally, Sheba has been associated with the land of Ethiopia. In fact, Ethiopia appears in multiple instances, uh, multiple references in both the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament, as it's called, and the Christian New Testament um, has Ethiopian characters in it. Uh, but in any case, um, the King Solomon was the son of King David, who was really kind of the, um, uh, the conqueror of the Israelite kingdom. Um, you know, the famous story of David and Goliath and all of that. Uh, and Solomon is the one who built the, the Jerusalem temple, uh, which was the ritual center of ancient Judaism. But he was visited, according to the story in the Bible, by uh, the Queen of Sheba or the Queen of Ethiopia. Now, the Kebron Agost picks it up there and claims that that, that visit of the Queen of Sheba led to a uh, sexual liaison between Solomon and the Queen, uh, and she became pregnant. This is not surprising, given that Solomon had... Uh, quite a number of wives, even the Bible um, talks about the hundreds of wives and concubines that he had. Now she became pregnant, went back to Ethiopia, and gave birth to a son named Menelik. Now Menelik uh, was visited by an angel, 
um, eventually when he came of age and was told to go back to Israel or to go to, I guess he'd never been, uh, to go where his mother had gone to see his father. And he was instructed by the angel that Israel had gone apostate, that they were no longer in God's favor, and that he needed to take the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you've seen Indiana Jones, you know something about this, perhaps. Um, but the Ark of the Covenant was the um, uh, legendarily the box um, or receptacle that contained the tablets that Moses brought down off of Mount Sinai, according to the biblical tradition, right? Um, and really, and, and the, the Ark of the Covenant was placed inside of the Jerusalem Temple uh, by Solomon um, and, and had a special place there. Um, and the Ark of the Covenant was, of course, the object that signified God's power and God's favor uh, to uh, people on earth. And so Melech went to Jerusalem, uh, again, according to the Kebron Agost, and uh, visited his father, um, his father, uh, proclaimed Menelik to be the heir of his kingdom, the heir of his rulership. Um, but uh, Menelik, even though he was taken with his father, uh, was still instructed by the angel to uh, take the, the Ark of the Covenant and to head back to Ethiopia. So he absconded with it in the night, um, and the Israelites were prevented from chasing after him. And, uh, you know, the text has the Israelites saying, well, I guess God's favor has been withdrawn from us and given to this other people. Um, and so this, according to tradition, is how the Ark of the Covenant ended up in Ethiopia. Now, I will say that it is belief of Ethiopian Christianity that the Ark of the Covenant, the real Ark of the Covenant, still rests in a church in Ethiopia at present, today. Um, and, and so Ethiopian Christianity takes on, uh, during the Solomonic period, um, and, and the reason these are called the Solomonic rulers is that they claim lineage or descent from King Solomon of Israel. Uh, it has a lot of Jewish elements to it. Um, it takes a lot of its cues from the Old Testament or the Hebrew tradition, uh, given that the Ark of the Covenant and other uh, sorts of ancient Israelite images are important in the worship. Now, they're, you know, the Ethiopian Christians still, of course, worship Jesus and, and uh, proclaim him to be the Son of God and all of that. Um, but that is mixed with these Solomonic traditions, and especially with the notion that the Ethiopian emperor, starting with Amdasion, um, in fact, they would, they would go back all the way uh, to King Azana and even before that and say that all of these people were part of the Solomonic lineage. Uh, but the... Um, the ruler of Ethiopia has special status before God as the true king of God's chosen people on earth, right? Um, and so that's the that's kind of the religious elements of it. There's a lot more to it, really. Um, uh, the Kebron Agos makes for, for fascinating reading. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I would highly recommend uh, checking that out. Okay. Now, socially and economically, uh, the Solomonic dynasty, which lasted for you know, really until about the 16th century, though it's weakened by that point. So for, you know, uh, two to three hundred years, this persists in, in relatively uh, stable form. Um, but it relied heavily on nobles uh, who held large amounts of land. Now, this is one of those places, in fact, in Africa, one of the few places where land is valuable. Um, and land had uh, special significance for political power. Ethiopians, among all Africans, were the uh, the only one, or at least one of the only ones, uh, in sub were the only one in Sub-Saharan Africa, to my knowledge, to develop plow technology and to use draft animals in farming. Um, and so they were able to work. And again, this is largely because of the tsetse fly and. You know, Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Highlands doesn't have that. Uh, so just about anywhere else in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is going to run into problems with uh, diseases and things. Um, so as we said in an earlier class, um, it's understandable why, you know, the parts of Africa don't have plows and draft animals and all these things. Uh, but Ethiopia does develop those things. And so they're able to, to farm uh, large amounts of land and these nobles come to control large amounts of land. Now, 
the tension here in Ethiopian societies between those nobles who were trying to control this land um, and uh, the more mobile and poorer parts of the population uh, who, um, like peoples in other parts of Africa, uh, were able to take their their tools um, and their seeds and move around uh, farming different uh, plots of land for a time uh, until they lost their fertility. Uh, really, we have just mobile uh, mobile farmers like we do in other parts of Africa. The nobles tried to keep these farmers in place so that they could charge taxes, uh, and the Ethiopian uh, Solomonic uh, period does witness very high taxation uh, for the people they were able to control. Um, uh, money and other resources flowed from the poor into the hands of the nobles and of the, the kings. Um, and so uh, that's one of the, and they came up with various ways to try to keep people in place. Among these are coercive measures like the imposition of armies and other things. They were not entirely successful though because, again, Africa is underpopulated and there were other places to go. Now, another way to try to um, uh, raise more taxes and um, extend the hegemony was to evangelize. And so this period also witnesses um, uh, Ethiopian Christian clergy uh, moving into the frontier regions of, Ethiopia, of the kingdom, uh, pushing the borders further and further as they tried to evangelize or proselytize uh, to people who were not converted to Christianity. Uh, in some cases, this was done forcibly by, by the sword, right? Um, and uh, other, another important factor in Ethiopian society was the presence of, of monks. Ethiopia, Ethiopian Christianity has uh, a well-developed monasticism. Uh, it is quite different from the monasticism of uh, Europe or the Mediterranean, um, but these monks were agents of evangelization. Um, and also, I think in some instances, they were opponents of, uh, you know, they, they had tried to broker their own political power, so to speak. Monasteries, uh, as in other parts of uh, the Christian world, did have um, a lot of power and probably were the beneficiaries of the taxation, though. Now, an interesting spinoff of this um, uh, kind of Hebrew-based, Old Testament-based theology, and, and really um, the origins of this group are um, somewhat uncertain, I believe, um, are a group called, sorry for the yawn, um, a group called the Falashas. These are African Jews. And they seem to originate in Ethiopia. Um, these may be people who uh, were uh, kind of uh, listeners to or participants in this whole um, Solomonic tradition uh, who turned away from Christianity and, uh, and accepted Judaism, or they may have been from South Arabia, may have been Jews who maintained their ancestral ties to the religion. The Falashas may have been uh, an influence, in fact, on the Solomonic rulers and their adherence to kind of Old Testament images and Old Testament norms. Uh, but in any case, there is a fairly large number of African Jews in Ethiopia historically. There, are, uh, Some of them are still there today. You know, the Falashas have since moved into other parts of Africa. Um, there's a fairly large group of them in Zimbabwe, for instance, which is a really... Uh, it's a pretty long distance from Ethiopia, but uh, a group of them have, um, uh, have settled there um, over the centuries and, and um, uh, you know, constitute an interesting, uh, interesting part of the culture of uh, Southern Africa. Um, I met a uh, Falasha Jew, for instance, had some interaction with a guy when I um, lived in England uh, some years ago, and uh, he was from Zimbabwe, um, but... Uh, a very committed Falasha Jew. I ended up um, reading the Bible with him on an occasion or two and, and uh, was interested to hear his interpretations of the sacred text, right? Um, uh, in any case, the, uh, the Falashas are a, a really more just trivia here, I think. Um, they don't uh, ever exert a tremendous influence politically, but there, there may be some shared culture here that we're looking at. Um, 
Now, as always, uh, the biggest threat to the Solomonic dynasty and to the stability of the Ethiopian kingdom was the threat of, of Islam, the threat of Muslims. And uh, by about the 16th century, um, Muslim incursions uh, were wreaking havoc on uh, the ability of the Solomonic rulers to keep things in, uh, in stable form, as it were. Um, and power at this point tended to devolve into the hands of the nobles, uh, most of whom were Christian, of course. Um, we also see at this point an invasion um, or two from a group of people from the south here called the Oromo. Um, some of them had converted to Islam. Some of them were uh, adherents to native religious forms. Um, but the Oromo destabilized Ethiopia. And uh, by the middle of the 16th century or so, Ethiopia, um, the unity of Solomonic Ethiopia has been um, uh, pretty much dealt a death blow. Now, it's at this point that the Portuguese, um, who of course had sailed around the Horn of, uh, sailed around the Cape uh, of Southern Africa, I should say, and up the east coast of Africa, all as part of their effort to procure resources, both in Africa and in um, uh, India and other parts of the world. Um, but uh, the Portuguese were interested in the stories they heard about a Christian kingdom in the interior of Africa. Um, these stories went back some centuries. They were often conflated with uh, rumors that went around uh, in Europe during, for instance, the Crusade period about Christian kings who lived on the other side of the Muslim lands with whom they might make an alliance. Um, there was a legend uh, starting in about the 12th century or so about a, a Christian king named Prester John and uh, who, who was Christian but, but lived on the, you know, kind of in the, uh, the east or the south. Uh, they were uncertain about the location uh, of the Muslim lands. And when the Portuguese got wind of uh, Ethiopia or the kingdom of Abyssinia, as it was called at this point, uh, they got excited and figured that this was probably the kingdom of Prester John. And so the Portuguese made contact. They, they sent uh, emissaries into the interior of Africa made contact with the Ethiopians, and lent them a lot of resources. Um, and it's at this point that Ethiopia begins their interesting dance with European Christians that will last really up until the middle of the 20th century, though it waxes and wanes uh, at different times. Um, but, uh, you know, Ethiopia is supported from this point on by Europeans, sometimes more, sometimes less, though Ethiopians did have to make concessions to uh, the Pope in Rome, for instance, um, claiming that they were, you know, good uh, Catholics here in Ethiopia, uh, which, of course, was um, pushing the truth a bit. But. Okay, there's plenty more we could say about Ethiopia. It's a fascinating place, and we will return to, uh, to Ethiopia when we talk about the 19th century, for instance. Um, but let's call it good from there. If you have questions, Feel free to bring them up on the discussion boards. Now, I want to shift gears here and uh, talk about West Africa. And I, I don't think that we will have time to go through all of this information. I try not to make these um, lectures, these video lectures, too long. And so I'm probably going to have to do a part two here uh, of this. Um, but um, in West Africa, what we have um, is what we might call a colonizing society. And if you're reading, uh, the Isle of Textbook, um, this should be a familiar term to you. Uh, these are people who, um, you know, were moving around uh, to procure more and more farmland, or as their farms uh, lost their fertility, they would move to, to other places. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's the trend, of course, that's been around in Africa for millennia. Uh, really since the advent of agriculture. Um, now, during the medieval period, though, in some places, in some parts of West Africa, uh, we begin to see um, the development of more permanent settlements, often nucleated settlements. Um, and uh, yet they bring the kind of ethos, um, the culture, the, the um, worldview, um, is another word we might use, 
of the the colonizing society with them, uh, even after they become more permanent. Um, to the left side of the slide here um, is an image um, from I think the 18th century, uh, maybe early 19th century, um, and so it's a bit after this period we're talking about, but it, I think it still demonstrates the point we want to make here of the concentric rings of settlement okay and this by the way is the context or part of the context at least that you want to use to understand the story of Sunjata um, because you know the, the society described there was very much one of these sort of colonizing society nucleated settlements um, and uh, uh, so look for that in the text. Anyway, uh, let me elaborate some on this. All right. So this, as I said, this image is of Benin City. Um, interestingly, Benin City is not in Benin. Uh, Benin takes its name from this. The modern nation of Benin, I should say, takes its name from this because this is such a famous um, kind of population center. But Benin City is actually in Nigeria today. Um, anyway, Benin City was established probably... Uh, during the Middle Ages, maybe 12th, 13th, 14th century, something like that. Um, and you can see that the, the, um, the settlement itself is laid out in these concentric rings, right? In the center are the residences of the people. Some of the huts here are larger than others. These would be the, the homes of the more prominent individuals. And then there is a fence around the inhabited part, right? Uh, now, the other part of the city is divided. The, other, the, the outer ring, I should say, of the city is divided into two parts. The part um, on the left-hand side over here is for the pasturage of animals. And you can see that there are a number of, um, uh, I don't know, these are cows or sheep or goats or maybe some of, some of all. Uh, of those and, and the herders with them, right, so with some sort of um, building here that probably was a, a pen to keep them in for protection. Um, and then over on the right-hand side here, we have um, uh, the farmland, right, some of the fields that they would be cultivating probably in yam crops, because yams, as we will read about in um, Things fall apart, were the king of all crops, though there are probably other things they were growing as well. Um, and then the other uh, ring, and then there's of course a fence built around all of that, right, for protection with a, couple, with a gate uh, on this end and a gate on this end and maybe one over here as well, right, um, and, and one here. So now the other concentric ring that is not hemmed in by a gate, by the way, is everything outside of this, the wilderness, okay, the forest. Um, and you're going to see in both Sunjata and Things Fall Apart the importance of the forest and the cultural conception of the forest. Um, in Sunjata, uh, we have hunters, right? Sunjata himself becomes a skilled hunter. And hunters occupy this very important position in the society um, because, of course, they procure food, but they also are held with some suspicion because they go into the wilderness. Um, at the beginning of Sunjata, um, these hunters come across, uh, they're, they're hunting a, a famous buffalo who has... Um, you know, uh, laid waste to a number of villages, and uh, they come across a woman who claims that she is the wraith of the buffalo, or that she is the spirit of the buffalo, or something like that, and that she is linked to this young woman named Sogolon, um, and that Sogolon, in fact, is her wraith, or, I don't know, her um, uh, connected personage, uh, bound together by supernatural ties somehow, something like that. Um, and she says, if you can, um, I, I'm tired of living, I want to die, um, and I'll tell you how to kill me, but you also uh, will want to possess this woman. Now, Sogolon, of course, is, is hideously ugly. She's a hunchback. She's, um, 
you know, uh, not exactly the most popular girl uh, in the in the village or anything like that. But she um, has within her all of this supernatural power, right? Well, the hunters gain this knowledge because they go into the wilderness and they're able to do, uh, they're able to to accomplish this. Although they cannot, of course, overcome Sogolon, and so they decide to give her to the king of Mali, uh, the ruler of um, uh, uh, of Mali, right? Um, to Magan Konfata, the father of Sunjata. Uh, who has to resort to tricks to overcome her. Um, and, you know, I don't want to summarize the entire story here. Uh, the point being that the ones who go into the wilderness gain special knowledge, but they also are in some way affected by that. They're tainted, perhaps. Um, uh, the hunters, it's thought, do strange things, right? Uh, that they give this woman to the king um, and get out of town sort of before the before the sun sets, right? And, and that's just passed off as the one of the odd things that hunters will do, right? Now, when things fall apart, you're going to read about the evil forest, um, about how that is the habitation of the gods and the demons, um, uh, of spirits who threaten human existence. Um, and so, you know, the evil forest is not something to be controlled. It's something to be ventured into in order to prove one's bravery in order to procure food from time to time, but uh, one should not um, venture too far or stay too long. One should certainly take care in the wilderness, right? And so the settlement here is, um, uh, the concentric rings of the settlement uh, provide safety from the wilderness or from the forest. Now, one of the things about Sunjata that you'll want to note is that he is able to go into the forest and conquer. Uh, he is a, an effective hunter. He really has no fear. Um, he takes his companions into the wilderness, masters the lore of the wilderness, all of the tricks that one needs to know in order to survive. Outside of a settlement, uh, he's in a, a kind of exile position for a long time, and yet he rises up above all of that to thrive and become the king of Mali, the king of this unified place. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the wilderness plays an important role there, and it's, it's linked to these notions of political supremacy or political power. Now, the mythology of migration is bound up with all of this. It's kind of the next point here, right? Um, that uh, the ancestors, the heroic ancestors, are the ones who braved the wilderness and brought us here um, to this place. This is it's really through storytelling that um, uh, the powers that be are able to uh, maintain uh, or, or produce incentives for people to stay in one place, right? To continue to be part of a social and cultural system. Uh, the Griyo in um, Sunjata, his, his spokesperson, his storyteller, his genealogist, um, he fulfills all of those roles. Uh, this is Balafaseke for um, uh, for Sunjata, right? Um, and uh, so he repeats to Sunjata the mythology of migration, the heroic stories of the ancestors who came to this place, who did heroic things, and now Sunjata has to live up to all of that, right? So even though the settlements are becoming more permanent, um, the, the history of migration remains an important, really an essential part of the culture of West Africa. Now, as I said, the environment is uh, important here. The wilderness um, is a threatening place. Uh, you know, disease also um, is often linked to the, the evil spirits who roam in the wilderness. If you do something to uh, anger them, they will probably send a disease or a famine or something like that. Uh, this is why um, Okonkwo, in Things Fall Apart, is forced to leave his home village for seven years because he inadvertently killed one of his kinsmen. Um, it was an accident, but, uh, you know, if he doesn't leave, then the gods are going to take vengeance on the whole of the people rather than on, on Okonkwo only, right? So, I mean, these are all of the fears that go along with this mythology, Um and uh, which informed, of course, the, um, uh, the structures of society, the way that they in imagined themselves and their place in the world. 
politically, one of the um, one of the terms that has often been applied to this West African situation, and really it's a term that we could apply to a number of historical situations in Africa, um, is the term big man. Okay, These um, nucleated settlements, uh, even the kingdoms and empires of West Africa um, in the Middle Ages were thought to be the work of great men, the big man. Uh, Sunjata is a big man, okay, um, who establishes power, who showers favors upon a network of kinsmen and allies who then do his bidding, um, and he's generous with them, right? The big man is the one who provides the incentives for everyone to stay in the same place and for society to function uh, and to be passed on from generation to generation. Now, of course, if a big man is um, abusive uh, or um, sort of exercises a kind of dominion um, unjustly or unrighteously over his people, then the society will be um, uh, fractured and, and uh, problematic uh, or will be, in other ways, an abomination. Now, the villain of the story of Sunjata, Sumo Oro, he's one of them. Um, of course, Sasuma Barete, uh, who is the the uh, the mother of, um, of the first wife of Magan Kontfata, uh, is another kind of villain in the story. And she herself oversteps her bounds by exercising the power of a big man um, in kind of domineering over her son, who inherits the throne from his father. Right. So, uh, but um, uh, you know, regardless of uh, of that, Suma Oro is another big man. Um, who has conquered all of these other places, but exercises power unjustly, uh, takes things from other people that he is not supposed to take, takes their wives, takes their griots, takes their lands, uh, takes their their things, even sort of steals their power. Um, Sumo Oro has this um, inner, inner lair, so to speak, where he has nine heads uh, of kings he has killed, and he uses the power that comes from them um, to increase his magical abilities, right? Um, uh, and so all of that, you know, is a kind of message about the in, the unjust exercise of power by a big man. Um, now, some interesting facets of the societies of West Africa, and I'm really kind of generalizing here, but we can see this played out in... Um, in both Sunjata and Things Fall Apart, though, though more in Things Fall Apart, I think. Um, women and children occupied an important position, but one that was um, uh, uh, subordinate um, uh, to, of course, the adult men in the society. Um, women could exercise power, but um, only through manipulating men for the most part. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the story again of Susuma Barete and Sunjata is of a woman who has overstepped her bounds, uh, gone beyond her place in the society, um, and, uh, not only denied the right of, uh, Sunjata, who should have been, he was the named heir by Magan Kunfata, uh, to the kingship. Um, it's not, not just her who does that, it's the council really, um, as well, but, um, uh, she even exercises authority over her son, who is the king, right? Over, um, oh gosh, I can't even remember his name at this point. Uh, um, Don Karan Tuman, that's what it is. Um, I don't have the text in front of me um, while I'm doing this, so my apologies. Uh, but, um, you know, she, uh, so she, you know, again, she shows kind of the illegitimate um, uh, use of, of uh, uh, female agency, um, as it were, right? Now, children were, uh, of course, very important. They were to inherit, uh, they were to be taught, um, uh, they were to uh, be the, the ones who, who took over the society eventually, and so they were very carefully trained, but, um, but their needs, uh, their desires, uh, often took a back seat to those of the adult men. And nowhere is this more the case than in um, the institution of marriage, um, and uh, particularly the customs of marriage, which were polygynous in West Africa. Polygyny means 
Um, polygamy itself just means plural marriage, meaning ha having multiple spouses. Polygyny uh, as a more um, uh, specific term means men taking multiple wives. That is the only form of polygamous relationship that we see uh, in West Africa and, in fact, in most societies uh, that, that have plural marriage, as it were. Okay. Um, now, the problem with, or I shouldn't say the problem, uh, that's uh, the, one of the issues with polygyny is that um, one must have a certain amount of wealth, resources, in order to support multiple wives. Okay, And so the ones who are most likely to um, feel entitled to take more than one wife are the older men who have gained wealth and prestige and honor in the society, right? Now, the eligible pool of bachelorettes, on the other hand, tended to be younger women, women who had only recently gone through puberty, perhaps, had reached childbearing and thus marriage age, as it was considered at that uh, in this society, okay, uh, in some African societies, women were probably quite young, maybe only in their mid-teens when they married. Um, uh, but uh, the men, um, and, and so it was frequently the case that a man who was 40 or 50 uh, years old or even older would take a young bride of 15 to 20 years old. Now, Perhaps you can see the social problems that would be, cre be created by this. These young women were peers of the sons and maybe even the grandsons of the men they ended up marrying. And if uh, they grew up together, they probably had uh, pre-existing relationships, possibly even romantic or sexual relationships with the young men, um, and yet they were taken by the older men uh, who could provide for them. It was impossible, and you'll read this in Things Fall Apart to some extent, uh, it was impossible for young men who had not yet made their fortune really to justify taking a wife, uh, at least one of any kind of status in the society, any kind of rank. Um, uh, and so this created generational conflict, rivalries between um, older men and often their sons, or at least men who were a generation younger, because they were competing with each other for the eligible bachelorettes, and most often the older men were the ones taking the girls who were the age of the younger men and marrying them. Now, one of the ways that some of these societies sought to mitigate this generational conflict was to create age grades and to uh, to make you know young people especially go through initiation rituals, um, age grades again. Um, I, I think we talked about this in an earlier class, but let me reiterate: uh, age grade systems um, hold that um, uh, people of a certain age have speci are given specific responsibilities in the society. They um, have rituals and other things associated with that age grade, and and during those years that they're part of an age grade, which might be you know each age grade covers like a five year span or something like that, um, they would take part in um, these specific ta in specific tasks that were again germane to the age grade, um, and you know s these include these initiation rituals. And so at the same time as these young men were going through these initiation rituals, proving themselves, the, the older men um, who had gone through all of that and had arrived you know, at honorable status in the society were then snatching up the young women uh, uh, while the young men were distracted, so to speak. Right? The, the most common initiation ritual uh, for men, certainly in Africa, was circumcision. Um, and this was not just a you know little trip to um, a guy with a knife um, to some kind of uh, healer or physician or whatever in the society. Um, uh, circumcision was a long, drawn-out ritual. Now, the actual act of cutting 
uh, blessedly was not a long drawn out affair. Um, when we read the dark child later in the semester, you will get a description of a, a circumcision ritual um, uh, because Kamar Alaye um, himself went through that. Um, but uh, um, circumcision involved a, a lot of sort of preliminary activities, often the removal of the young men from the society, uh, placing them in um, you know an, an out of the way location, probably in their own compound, their own huts, uh, often um, you know making them go through periods of meditation and communion with the gods and the ancestors. Uh, all sorts of rituals, um, feasting as well as fasting, um, and finally the um, uh, the circumcision itself, which would be a, in most cases a public ceremony, and then a period of recovery where they were not supposed to interact, especially with women, um, and once they had healed from the wound caused by the circumcision, then they could emerge fully into the society as an adult male. Um, Though they still had lesser status because they had not yet worked their way up, earning titles and other honors, to the point where they could necessarily um, uh, take a marriage partner, uh, but they could probably begin their own farms and, and uh, you know, do things that adult men were supposed to do. Right. So, so all of these um, systems are created again to mitigate this generational conflict, but it, but it almost certainly did exist uh, in this world. Okay. Now, if you have questions about other cultural features, please ask them um, if there's something in the book that you read. For instance, this is not an exhaustive uh, kind of treatment of West African culture. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things that, if, as it comes to mind, that you might be asking is, uh, did, you know, was there also female circumcision? Um, in West Africa, um, I think that this was fairly rare. It is common in other parts of Africa. Um, but uh, and of course in the Arab world in the in the Middle East, um, but uh, uh, to my knowledge, not a lot of uh, female circumcision or female genital mutilation, as uh, we call it today, uh, in in those places. Um, circumcision was primarily a male activity done by young men who were in their late teens. Okay, finally coming to the political hegemonies of West Africa. And uh, this is also where we um, arrive at a, a fuller discussion of uh, the tale of Sunjata. But first, another really important term if we want to understand um, the situation in West Africa. The term Kafu means um, a kind of collection of villages that come together to form a political unit. And this is one of the more common um, uh, political forms in West Africa. Now, in some cases, a Kafu might rise up and either via conquest or the creation of alliances um, will then form a larger kingdom or empire. Okay, the tale of Sunjata is really the tale of a Kafu, um, Niani, which allies itself in fighting against the king of Soso, um, who is attempting to conquer uh, the whole terror, the whole land, uh, unites with all of these other Kafus to form a kingdom, and then they go on and, and conquer Soso and other places and incorporate them into the kingdom as well. Right, but really it starts out as a Kafu. Okay, I think it could be said that Umuofia in uh, uh, Things Fall Apart is a Kafu um, of sorts, though it probably that's probably not the word that was used there. Um, now, this is, I mean, this kind of political entity again was common in West Africa, certainly common in the Sahel region. But we also find things like this in many other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, these uh, kind of alliance or unity of villages um, that, uh, you know, come together um, for mutual protection, for the creation of uh, markets and, and other things, um, and that may even um, have an army, uh, a uh, military force that fights against others and, and possibly even conquers others to form a larger 
a larger entity, a larger hegemony. Okay, not the absolute norm, um, or rather, it's the norm, but it's not uh, not the only kind of political form we find in West Africa. But it's really, really common. Um, and this is almost certainly how these large empires started as a kafu. Um, the tale of Sunjata hints that that's what happened, but of course this is only an oral tradition, so we should not take it as the absolute record of the formation of the kingdom of Mali, right? Now, Sunjata himself, again, is a figure shrouded in myth, shrouded in legend. Um, we, we cannot take this at, at face value necessarily, but we can perhaps glean a lot of interesting historical information from this. I think that it's fairly well accepted that uh, Sunjata, um, or you know, the, the, whoever it was uh, that, that began the Kingdom of Mali, he is the legendary founder in the Kingdom of Mali, uh, was able to do this because he brought about a unification of people, so unification of Kafus uh, to form this larger kingdom. Now, what sorts of things should we look for in the tale of Sunjata. Well, the prompt asks you to uh, sort of set this in its political context, to talk about political forms in Africa, um, and that really means, as we've, as we've said many times, this notion of power over people, the creation of incentives that create networks uh, of people dependent on um, uh, the ruler, the one who exercises power, and also sort of codependent with each other. Um, well, I think we find plenty of that in Sunjata. Um, one of the things to note here is, again, the migration mythology that's tied to the ancestors, and especially the, the, uh, the role that the griot, the lore keeper, plays in West Africa, right? When uh, Sunjata is at the key moments of his life, the first time he walks, for instance, uh, Balafaseke is there to sing about it and to write a story and songs that, that get repeated. Um, uh, when uh, Sunjata is ready to lead his warriors into battle against Suma Oro, uh, Balafaseke is there to give the big speech um, uh, in front of everyone on behalf of Sun Sunjata talking about the ancestry of this great man and, and uh, how he is now realizing the, the heroism of the ancestors and all of that. Uh, on the other hand, it is, you know, um, a terrible offense when, first of all, Duncan Tuman, uh, his half-brother, takes Balafaseke away from him and sends him uh, as a, a kind of um, emissary to a, a neighboring kingdom. Uh, this is the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. This is the thing that forces Sunjata to leave. Um, uh, and with the promise, of course, that he will come back and claim what is his, right? Um, and uh, that, that threat is not well received by Duncan and Tumon. Um, who, by the way, and this is typical to African literature, just kind of disappears from the story. Sunjata leaves, goes off, you know, has all these adventures kind of wandering in the wilderness. And uh, Duncan and Tuman and his, and his mother, Sassuma Barete, are left um, in control of Mali, um, but, or Niani, as it's still called at that point. Um, and, uh, and then when, Su when Sunjata comes back to claim his kingdom, Duncan and Tuman and Sassuma Barete are gone. Um, presumably, Duncan Tuman is one of the nine heads in the fetish room of um, uh, of uh, Suma Oro, um, but uh, that's uncertain, right? Um, in any case, he just sort of disappears, and this this often happens in African folklore tales that you have a a character who plays a very important role, and then all of a sudden, like they just they're gone um, and never come back into the story, and we never find out what happens to them, and um, you know, aesthetically and, and uh, uh, literarily, so to speak, uh, Africans don't, African folklore doesn't have a problem with that, all right? Uh, but the griot does come back, or rather when Sunjata comes back, uh, Balafaseke is there to greet him and to help him. Uh, Suma Oro does take Balafaseke, um, lays claim to him, which is, of course, illegitimate, 
and this gives um, Sunjata even greater incentive to uh, to fight against Sumoto. Balafaseke then escapes and, and delivers to, to uh, Sunjata um, the uh, information that he needs to defeat Suma Oro, um, uh, the uh, sort of key to, or his key weakness, right? Another thing you might notice in this story is that uh, Sunjata exercises power not just because he's a great hunter and a great warrior, though that, of course, is important. If he didn't have military prowess and skill with the bow and the spear and all of that, um, he almost certainly would not be an effective ruler. That, that is necessary for respect and honor um, and, the, and the wielding of political power. But he also has to use his wits. He has to become the master of other things. And so a couple of um, what I think are, are some of the key moments in this text. One of them is where, and I forget which king it is. The king I don't think it's the king of Ghana. It's the king of some other place. Anyway... Um, this guy who has been bribed, and he tells Sunjata, you know, let's play Wadi. Wadi is another name for a game called Mancala, which you may have played. Um, and uh, they play Wadi, and this guy says, I never lose, and, and if I beat you, I am going to kill you. Um, and Sunjata says, okay, we'll do your worst, right? And they play Wadi, and Sunjata defeats him. Um, and so he, you know, he's able to use his wits. He becomes the master of the game, um, as it were. And then this plays out, I think, on an even larger scale um, in the lead up to the final battle with Suma Oro, uh, when Sunjata and he go to battle, uh, a battle of wits, really over repeating proverbs. Proverbs are wise sayings. They're often allegorical. That is, they have symbolic meaning to them. Um, and, you know, Suma Oro and he sort of take turns uh, sending these proverbs to each other. Um, uh, so one of them says, you know, I am the, I am the wild yam and, you know, I am, okay, I am the, I forget what it is. He's going to crush the rock and eat the yam. I can't remember. And I wish I had the text in front of me. I apologize. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I am the poisonous mushroom, while I am the fearless rooster, or, uh, and I will eat you. I, I don't pay attention to poison, right? And it becomes clear eventually that Sunjata is matching and defeating Suma Oro wit for wit, or proverb for proverb, until finally Suma Oro just kind of gives up, and he says, enough, you, you shall not have Mali, right? And, and uh, Sunjata, just to sort of prove his superiority, pulls out one more proverb. He says there is no room for uh, for two kings or on the same mat or something like that. There's no, no room for two at the same kalabash of rice, or I can't remember the exact uh, saying, but it's another proverb, right? I, I, I've got one more um, beyond, and, and you're out of material, so to speak, right? Uh, so that's important, I think, for the wielding of political power. The political strategy for Sunjata, of course, is to unify people, to create networks of dependent people, um, people who are willing to join with him because he is so generous. He gives to his allies uh, not just empty promises, but, but he actually comes through, gives them prosperity and land and all of that, right? Whereas Suma Oro takes it by force um, and thus makes a lot of enemies. Um, so we can see the coercion is even though you know it's necessary to be able to fight, uh, coercion is not um, the only way to wield political power. And in fact, it's, it's probably not the best way to wield political power because somebody at some point is going to rise up and, and overthrow you or conquer you. And then finally, um, you should consider the religious syncretism in this text. Uh, the, the tale begins by talking about the griots who have told the story from time out of mind, right? Um, and uh, one of the things that they have noted is that Sunjata and his father, Magan Konfata, are descended from one of the companions of the prophet Muhammad. Now, <laughs> this almost certainly is a later addition to the text because, of course, the, the kingdom of Mali or the lands controlled by the king, formerly controlled by the kingdom of Mali, uh, became in more recent times um, predominantly Muslim 
territories. Um, uh, if you didn't get that, I said Muslim territories through that yawn. Um, the predominantly Muslim territories. And so it was important for storytellers over time in recounting the story of this great leader in you know, their region to link him in some way to Islam, right? Now, was Islam existing in the kingdom of Mali at the time of Sunjata? Probably, though, only uh, in the kind of barest of forms, almost certainly. Um, uh, it is embraced uh, quickly by the rulers of Mali, though still in a kind of syncretic form with plenty of uh, religious ideas uh, left over from the traditional African systems. And you can see that, of course, in Sunjata. I mean, they talk about, um, you know, uh, worshiping Allah, but at the same time, they talk about the, you know, the, the spirits of the wilderness and um, uh, the wraith of the buffalo. And there are all of these kind of supernatural elements that come from the indigenous religious traditions. Um, and so Sunjata is the master of all of that, uh, yet he's also tied in uh, to, you know, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad. He has these links to the heroic Muslim past, uh, dating from or, or originating from the Arabian Peninsula. Now, that's all I'm going to say about the tale of Sunjata. Um, if you have questions... Uh, I mean, you must read this. It is not a hard read. I think it's actually quite a, a pleasurable read. Um, you will note probably some similarities between this and The Lion King, um, which I think was taken at least partly from the tale of Sunjata. If it wasn't, um, then that's an incredible coincidence uh, because, you know, you have the young boy who leaves uh, because his kingdom has been taken from him illegitimately and he returns to... Uh, a land where power is wielded unjustly, right? And so, I mean, it's the same story, essentially. Um, but uh, we, we will go on and talk a bit more about the Kingdom of Mali here for the last few minutes and, and then get into some of the later empires. Uh, like the Kingdom of Ghana, which came before it, I um, mean, you can see that this map shows the, uh, uh, the, the rough boundaries of all of these different kingdoms, uh, Ghana, um, was, you know, kind of stretching down to the Niger River, but north here into the Sahara Desert. Um, the Kingdom of Mali was uh, quite a bit bigger. Um, in fact, um, this map, I think, shows one that is slightly smaller than some other maps depict. Um, I've seen maps that show it going all the way over here to the Atlantic coast, though probably with less uh, hegemony as we get further away from the political centers. But uh, like the Kingdom of Ghana, this, the political power was wielded in Mali uh, due to the control of resources. That was, that was intimately bound up with the exercise of power. The resources, again, are gold, um, the key one, but also probably slaves and salt uh, and other resources that were in high demand uh, in the, in the trans-Saharan trade routes. Um, by the 14th century, the rulers of Mali had embraced Islam um, and even came to some notoriety for their practice of Islam. Uh, the ruler of Mali about whom we probably know the most, apart from the oral tradition of Sunjata, is the 14th century ruler Mansa Musa. Um, let's go to this slide here for a second. Uh, Mansa Musa is here pictured in... Um, a map produced in Europe, I believe in the Iberian Peninsula. This is um, the kind of map, this is what's called a Portolan chart. Um, it, the purpose of this is really just to show all of the port locations along the sea routes. But it does show some detail of the interior of Africa here. And one of the key features, one of the key things on display is this picture of Mansa Musa. Now, note about Mansa Musa that he is a black African, right, and dressed in a kind of traditional African uh, garb here. But at the same time, he also is wielding the royal accoutrements of a European monarch. He has a gold crown, he has a gold scepter, 
and he is holding in his hand a gold orb. Now, two things of note here. Okay, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that according to European conceptions, at least the conception of this map maker and probably those who hired him, uh, this ruler from the interior of Africa was of equal status, as it were, um, to the crowned heads of Europe in this period, right? Has the same kind of trappings of royalty. Uh, and the second thing to note here is everything that he's holding is gold, right? Because Mali was famous for its gold. This is the place where gold came from, according to European conceptions, right? Uh, this is the thing that began to inspire the Portuguese uh, in, you know, the time not long after the reign of Mansa Musa to um, make incursions into Africa, to improve their sailing technology so that they could, uh, you know, they didn't have to deal with the Trans-Saharan traders um, and instead could establish direct links via the sea to the interior of Africa and the, the uh, rich gold deposits that lay therein, right? Um, Sunjata was uh, recorded as having gone on Hajj, or pilgrimage to Mecca, um, and during his lifetime, and uh, he took with him so much gold and gave it, gave it away in such large amounts that he nearly collapsed the economy of Egypt. He, he simply sort of opened his coffers and showered gold upon everyone, and gold was relatively scarce and quite valuable in Egypt before that. But after Mansa Musa got done giving gifts of gold to people and giving people gold out of charity, that uh, the, the value of gold absolutely plummeted and the economy was shocked as a result of that, right? Uh, how much that is true is uncertain, but I think that the tale of, of Mansa Musa going on pilgrimage is probably a reliable one, um, and certainly the wealth of the king of Mali, um, such that he could give away such large amounts of gold, uh, is probably accurate as well. Okay. Now, uh, Mali was gradually conquered by its neighbors. Um, some of this was due to internal weakness and to the incursion of nomadic peoples from um, the interior of the Sahara Desert, Berber peoples, who, seeing the weakness of the Kingdom of Mali, decided to make raids back to the, the uh, Chaldunian model that I introduced in the last lecture here, right? By the, um, by the early 15th century, uh, the once rich and powerful kingdom of Mali was a shell of its former self and was conquered by an empire from uh, the east, slightly to the east of the empire of Mali. This is called the Songhai Empire. Um, it was centered on the city of Gao. And shockingly, Gao is not even shown here. Let me see if I can find, uh, if we go back here. Yeah, okay. So, you know, this is another version, another map of the, of the uh, Empire of Mali. Uh, Gao is just to the east, of, and it's kind of southeast of Timbuktu here. And that was the key city in uh, the, in the Songhai Empire. Um, this was ruled, uh, the Songhai Empire lasted only for about a century to a century and a half. Uh, it was a military-based empire. Um, the empire was achieved largely by conquest. Uh, the conquest of what remained of Mali was not very difficult because Mali was in such uh, disarray by this point. All of the cities that had been part of the empire, cities, towns, villages, kafus, um, you know, were functioning more or less independently. And so a military group under the leadership of a guy named Sony Ali Bear. And notice the, um, uh, the, the Arabic here, right? Um, this is a Muslim empire at this point. Uh, established rule over a large territory um, with his capital at Gao, right? Uh, the empire of Songhai was an agricultural one that relied very heavily on the labor of slaves. Um, and so Sony, Sony Ali Bear and the other leaders of, uh, the, of the Songhai uh, showered favors on nobles who held large numbers of slaves. Um, and uh, the, the other thing that really kind of, and, and so it was, it was more diffuse, uh, power was devolved out to 
um, kind of the, the, the military uh, leaders in the society. As a result, the, st the uh, succession to the throne was somewhat unstable. There was a lot of conflict between the various uh, powerful uh, military leaders over the absolute rulership of the empire, um, and this left it in a rather weakened condition. It never reached the stable heights that Mali had done uh, in previous centuries. And uh, an invasion from Morocco of the Sultan of Morocco, whose name was Ahmad al-Mansur, in the 1590s dealt a death blow to Songhai. Um, and the parts of Songhai that had been, or, you know, Songhai fractured into various parts. Some parts of Songhai were incorporated into uh, the growth of smaller states, um, uh, the Hausa states, which were a bit to the south and east of the kind of heartland of Songhai. Um, but there were, and, and you know, none of these produced large empires. Um, we won't really see a large empire again in West Africa until the Sokoto Caliphate in the 19th century, something we'll bring up in a later class. Uh, but, um, you know, Khanem um, uh, was another area, not really uh, a full hegemony uh, that centered on Lake Chad here and stretched up into the Sahara. Um, really a kind of confederation of different Kafus. Same thing for the Hausa states over here uh, to the west between, you know, what had been the Sungai Empire and Khanem. Uh, both Khanem and the states, uh, the small states of Hausa land, were reliant on the commerce across the Sahara. Again, the supply of things like slaves and salt and gold. Um, um, slaves at this point, I think, take primacy over gold. Um, but supplying those things to the traders coming, uh, moving back and forth across the Sahara. Uh, horses were a key commodity and a key to the maintaining of power in the society. Those who exercised power tended to own a lot of horses. That was the symbol of their wealth. It was also uh, the symbol of their military might. Um, that They had horses that they could fight on. Um, and these horse owners, the horse owning leaders of the society, held large numbers of slaves who work, who did the agricultural labor and the surplus of, of whom were traded uh, across the Sahara, right? Now, in Khanem and in Hausa land, um, we see again the syncretism of Islam and in the, in the indigenous religious forms, um, and this really persists all the way through, um, you know, from the 16th century all the way to the 19th century. That is never completely integrated the lack of full integration is one of the things that inspires Usman Danfodio to conquer the territory and establish what is known as the Sokoto Caliphate. Because they held so many horses, they were able to, you know, fight with cavalry. Um, and cavalry, much as it was in medieval Europe, was key to the military uh, experience and military success uh, in these smaller states that took the place of larger empires. All right, um, I am going to stop there. Um, I, I want to do a part two of this, which should be somewhat shorter, uh, to talk about some of the economic and cultural aspects of West Africa and also get into um, uh, areas to the south of the Sahel, um, the rainforest region of West Africa, which had its own particular political forms. Um, and so we'll discuss that next time. Thank you.